Uh, my name is Lee Pivnik, and I'm an artist based in Miami. And as mentioned, I'm, I'm not a landscape architect. I'm actually so thrilled at the invitation to be here. I am a sculptor, so I do feel a little at home at the Nasher. Um, or I'd like to one day. <laughs> it's quite nice. <laughs> um, but beyond that, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out how cool this specific speaking invitation is for me, because I, I speak a lot in art institutions and at schools and academic settings, but um, I'm in my own work moving more and more towards architecture and landscape architecture right now. And um, my, my dad is uh, in landscaping. Um, previously, he and my mom were both elementary school teachers, but he made a tree sticking product called Arbor Brace, and he's on the mailing list for the Cultural Landscapes Foundation. And so he was like, look, my work email is getting that you're doing things. <laughs> so it was just cool. I've never really collided with his world like that. But, um, but my name is Lee Pivnik. Um, look at, uh, hopefully better position slide out there. <laughs> um, I'm a sculptor. There's a sculpture in the top left there that I've made. Um, just to give you a basis of who I am in this moment is um, I, well, when I grew up in Miami, um, I wanted to be a wildlife photographer, and that brought me down to the Everglades every weekend and made my parents drive me before I could drive a car to, to photograph at sunrise. And so I'm, but I'm lucky to be living in a city between two national parks with the expansive swampy river of grass uh, to the west and Biscayne Bay with its sea grasses and, and fish and uh, urban coral populations uh, to the east. Um, but both ecosystems are uh, significantly altered by the presence of the city. They're heavily engineered, one drained and one dredged, so that their kind of hydrology, biodiversity, and ongoingness are threatened. Um, and so I very much like have come just from where I'm living to understand the relationship between the built and natural environment through seeing it as the entire surrounding right there. And I want to keep living and working in Miami. It's the only place I'll ever know intergenerationally. Um, but it's the city itself is at this point of precarity. Um, it's uh, as a coastal city, it's at greatest financial risk to the sea level rise in the world. Um, but it's also the least affordable city in the U.S. Of, as of this year. And so it's this total. It makes no sense on how you can keep living there. But um, it's like a thrilling challenge in a race against time. And one of the projects I'm working on right now there um, that is kind of actually the culmination. Where like I'm going to talk about how we got there in today's talk. Um, but what I'm working on and looking at right now is how to create a multi-use space for multi-species survival. Imagined kind of in the lineage of Florida's House of the Future projects, but as a domestic-sized institution, as a lab for climate care, um, the goal is eventually a constructed building um, that meets the like full requirements of the living building challenge, but is also climate adaptable to the climate of tomorrow in, in Miami, and is then also a kind of arts and culture and nature culture learning center. Um, and so that's, and the, the project is called Symbiotic House. Um, but, um, that took a while to get there. I, I, like, I started off a trajectory where I wanted to be a landscape photographer. And for the years since then, I was a sculptor and, and I had my own crisis with sculpture previously where I <laughs> basically, uh, wanted a more expanded practice, um, which ultimately, uh, became what we're going to talk about today, which is the Institute of Queer Ecology. Um, but I was coming from this background in sculpture. It was 2017. We were ripe off the uh, 2016 election that kind of presented this urgency around both like a, a new administration coming in that was going to be working against all the social progress and environmental progress we had seen. And so, and it just felt so contradictory to be making art about something that ended in this like static sculptural object, <laughs> like for me that would exist in kind of like white walled gallery spaces kind of removed from the the activist front of it. And so I wanted a practice that felt more collaborative. There's this kind of like myth of the artist that it's like this individual working away in a studio and there's and it's not that. It's it's a very collaborative um career and I wanted something that put that first and foremost there. But I also for the first time in my work, I mean I've been interested in environmental and ecological issues for as long as I was a little kid. But I was interested in re-looking at queerness directly in my work for the first time. And this was coming fully out of a moment where I was in love. I was like in love and in a relationship for the first time in my life that felt so like safe and joyful and warm. And I think you need to be in those kind of spaces to have this kind of ability to then step out and put yourself into activism. We've talked a lot about like where activism meets joy today. And like this project came out of that for me, and I, I don't think I would have done it in another way. But in short, I 
we'll give you kind of an overview today of the Institute of Queer Ecology, some of the projects we've worked on, what queer theory looks like when brought into um, ecological space and how you can relate them back to each other. And we're going to talk about a video game I made. <laughs> so it's truly, I, you'll see that I kind of work across mediums and across projects, um, trying to reach certain audiences in ways that are exciting to them and that the medium is not as important to me as the message. And so let's see. So this is, these are some people who've worked with the Institute of Queer Ecology. We've worked with over 125 artists since its inception in 2017. And the Institute is a, it's an artist project. It is a curatorial platform uh, for presenting uh, publications and films and um, exhibitions and um, a, a video game <laughs> that we'll get into in a bit. But, but we frame ourselves as an institute as an act of subversion, uh, positioning artists as authority figures by mimicking a trusted mode of research in academia that's often taken more seriously for knowledge production than artists and designers. When it, it's clear that we know that artists and designers are crucial for imagining futures, we're rarely granted a seat at the table for kind of advising or uh, decision making in relation to environmental issues. So our institute is a elaborate multi-year performance of mimicry, using kind of the institutional language and the baggage that comes with it to position ourselves at these tables. And so in queer terms, this performance is similar to how Judith Butler described gender as a performance. We are passing as an institute, like this leaf-tailed gecko is passing as a leaf. But beyond passing, our queer performance as an institute could be considered a form of dazzle drag a flamboyant presentation so visually charged that it's an experiment in standing out instead of blending in. This orchid mantis attracts more bugs than the orchids around it by being larger and more colorful in size. Um, so it doesn't, in, in nature, it doesn't like sit on orchids to camouflage. It sits out in the open and attracts bugs and eats them. But um, it's a really cool bug because also when it was first um, discovered or like, you know, logged into like the lexicon of European knowledge, um, it was by this uh, biologist, Alfred Ruff Russell Wallace, who thought it was a carnivorous plant. So it was like stupefying the scientific systems that like <laughs> created a lot of the issues we have today around landscape and other species. And so we'll talk a bit about queer ecology as a thing. Um, I'm not going to read every quote here, although if I had the time, I'd love to, because there's something about each of them that has this kind of like invocation of the, the people that wrote them and who have come before in the practice. But I'll, I'll synthesize a bit of Jose Esteban Munoz's here because he from, has been one of the most important people to me in, in this creation of the project. And he's from Miami. Um, he's from Cuba, but grew up in Miami. And so he writes actually a lot in his work about kind of the, um, the effect that the like, alternative club scene in Miami had on him as a youth and, and building his perception of world building and queer theory. And so just in super short, uh, queerness is not yet here. Queerness is an ideality. Put another way, we are not yet queer. We may never touch queerness, but we can feel it as the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. We have never been queer, yet queerness exists for us as an ideality that can be distilled from the past and used to imagine a future. Skipping ahead, queerness is essentially about the rejection of a here and now and an insistence on potentiality or concrete possibility for another world. And this is from his book, Cruising Utopia, um, the then and there of queer futurity. He, as well as Bell Hooks in this quote, worked to position queer theory as an act of world building, an act of imagining another way of inhabiting the world, a world that's much more uh, about the intimate connections between things, um, but also imagines like a, a queer politics that's not so like caught up in the moment today about like if certain groups should be allowed to serve in the U.S. military when it's like, is that, are we fighting to fight in the military? Like <laughs> there are other things to, to fight for, <laughs> but um if you're looking for that kind of intimacy in scientific circles, you kind of end up in ecology pretty quickly. Thomas Berry has a quote here about um, intimacy in relation to ecology. Um, and so, I, again, I, I could read these in their whole books to you for hours, and I'd be so happy up here. But, <laughs> um, but ecology is basically what science has offered us to find, that interconnectivity. It breaks down the borders between categorization, between individual nodes in the ecosystem, and illuminates a world that we can think as much more permeable and fluid. Ecology is also about intimacy, and much of that is inherently queer and strange. Um, on a changing planet, I believe that queer people are uniquely positioned to lead on climate issues through embodied strategies inherent to queer life. And so I'm not just interested in talking about how, of course, queer people and other marginalized groups are, of course, much more um, vulnerable to climate change. This is like language just kind of starting to be caught up into like, um, 
UN climate reports, like we're just getting to that point still where like marginalized groups are seen as more vulnerable and that's like ending up in policy. But I think beyond that, this like multicultural interpretation to issues is so critical to find new solutions out of environmental degradation. Um, and so from a queer point of view, which is incredibly limited, I can only ever speak for myself. Um, but on an individual level, I believe queerness is about mutability. Um, and that means it's about change and fluidity and transformation in relation to identity. Um, but then super helpful to think through those embodied life skills on a changing planet. And on a collective level, I think queerness is about mutualism, about mutual support networks that come to life in the absence of traditional support from governments, institutions, and families. Queer life is shaped and molded by change and mutual support. So when we discuss climate adaptation, change and mutual support are never far. Um, mutability and mutualism are not necessarily unique to queer life. I think we're hearing uh, either them or synonyms for them all day here today, because I think that they're found in other uh, knowledge systems from indigenous communities and feminisms and Afrofuturist studies, but they're not found in extractive capitalism. And so I think that's kind of the goal of this multicultural um, sense of interpretation. So I'm going to talk about a specific project we've done now. This was in relation to the exhibition Countryside the Future, which was at the Guggenheim in 2020 and 2021. It was a fantastic exhibition um, by Rem Koolhaas and uh, Samir Bantal, um, but it was closed almost immediately after opening because of COVID. And we were reached out uh, to from the museum, which was shocking. <laughs> um, and we had like, had, we had seen like a, a March 2020 where like we had seen everything we had planned for the rest of the year be canceled. And then like a cold call from the Guggenheim that was like, hey, we are going digital and <laughs> are interested in involving the Institute in an interpretation and a read of this exhibition, Countryside the Future. And so the exhibition from Rem was looking at the, the future of the countryside, which is, as he described it, 98% of the Earth's surface that isn't already a city. And so we thought that what we could do as a read on this is understanding what queer geography looked like in relation to the countryside. Um, and when I say we, this came together as a group of nine artists, I believe, which included some curators, um, some uh, video game designers, spoiler alert, some uh, game developers, and a sound artist. But um, we would meet weekly and talk about how this could come together. Um, and I'm going to also just check my timer here for you. I know we're on a, a crunch. But um, in relation to queer geography, this is um, a project, Queering the Map, that we looked at as inspiration. Queering the Map is a open source mapping software um, hosted online where you can add in your own a story of a, a positive or negative or neutral queer experience. So this is a map of where we are right now. You can see, I forget how many there were, a couple, a handful of little pegs um, where people have logged their stories in relation to the neighborhood we're in right now. And there's a cute little story there about um, rocking arm in arm and getting a little nervous. Um, moving rurally, this is a much more zoomed out map um, over Missouri. And you can see just the, the lack of experiences being logged, but also um, one that is logged about uh, falling in love and it getting awkward and being messy and moving back to California out of that experience. And so essentially we were interested in how um, relationships to each other, um, but also to the land, to uh, energy production, to food production, change in queer communities that are in rural and countryside spaces. And we were interested in the queer commune movement specifically. This was in part because the co-director of the project, Nicholas Baird, who's been working with the Institute since 2017, grew up on a, a commune that his grandfather started in Arizona. And so we were looking at a couple different places for inspiration here. Lavender Hill, which is one of the oldest queer communes um, in, uh, it was around Ithaca, and Salmon Creek Farm, which was not uh, a queer commune to begin, but is, uh, was a kind of back-to-the-land commune that's been reimagined now as a queer center or a artist residency kind of somewhere between a, a farm and a homestead and an artist residency prioritizing queer people. And you can see there's a little cute photo from this year where I get to, got to go up there um, with Nicholas and we worked on repairing one of their cabins. Um, they did like a work trade residency prioritizing queer and femme people that wouldn't find themselves on uh, construction jobs. And so we were then stuck with all these contradictions on if we were trying to explain the queer commune movement to an audience that was digital, that was remote, that was trying to encounter um, a space of being closer to the land and closer to each other, but through a screen home alone for the ultimate presentation, it was the question of what could a digital commune look like? 
And so, you know, it's a, it's a space full of contradictions. It's um, uh, one of the people I was consulting with, who's a friend of mine who was living at Short Mountain Sanctuary, which is a commune in um, Tennessee, had to walk off the mountain and about a mile down the road to get cell service to talk to me about it. And so you have this difference in like a, you're telling the story of places that often don't have access still to the kind of internet you would need to run a video game. <laughs> um, so yeah, how can you distill that experience? What can you distill from these experiences that are more private and more guarded? And ultimately, we returned back to looking at the the output from uh, Ithaca, from the Lavender Hill uh, commune, where they published a book. They actually had to create their own publishing company to publish the book because no one would publish their book. And it was called The Faggots and Their Friends Between Revolutions. Um, and it's this like, um, I don't know, it's this kind of like joyful like fable um, describing the lives of the faggots and their various groups of friends, which include the strong women who are like the feminists and the queens, which are the drag queens, as they attempt to survive and find joy and beauty and humor and pleasure and freedom in ramrod and empire declining uh, and dominated by oppressive militaristic men. And so it, it started as this goal. They were trying to create a children's fable um, that like distilled kind of what they were learning from this new way of relating to each other. And they realized it could never be a children's fable. So it's this kind of like a funny, dirty book. Um, and and it's, it's, I love it to death. It, it, for many years, since they, only, they published it themselves, they would um, reproduce it as like Xerox copies and people would just pass those around. And so the, the book has now been republished. But when it was... It um, has a prelude that encourages you to basically read it once and then hand it off to someone <laughs> and so to c continue that spirit. But so um, in, the, in the spirit of that, we realize essentially that what could be distilled from this is this act of sharing to create a social space digitally um, that invited, like we were invited into the museum shockingly and the, the door opened. We talked about in, in the keynote earlier about when, it, when a door opens and you, you walk through it. I heard a great quote years ago from um, someone uh, who's a friend and became my boss for many years, Naomi Fisher, about when uh, in, in these artist-run uh, organizing spaces that when a door opens, you jam your foot in and get as many people in as you can. And so, so we did that with the museum, and we created a program that worked that people could upload their own works into this web-hosted game that's on the museum's website. Um, so that everybody, um, just by going to the Guggenheim's website, is now a kind of co-creator of the work. Um, it was in partnership with the public programs team and the curatorial team. So we wanted to feel like a public program that people were not just an audience in. And so I think we'll queue up a video now, if we can get that running, um, that'll explain it better than I can. Although it's me explaining in the video. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Horizon, Habitat 1, Regenerative, Interconnected Zone of Nurture, an artwork by the Institute of Queer Ecology taking form as a digital commune. The multiplayer, 3D rendered virtual space considers queer geography in relation to the future of land use. The primary activity performed in Horizon is the sharing of knowledge as a political gesture, a communal project, to imagine an interdependent future for mutual benefit. This is done through the direct uploading of artwork, such as images, texts, videos, audio files, and other media into the networked game. In the forest, Lucy Gleek has shared a lithograph of vultures. At the power plant, Matthew Brown has uploaded a recipe for biofuel. In the kitchen, Allison Church offers us a cookbook based on Pennsylvania's native plants. Anyone is welcome to contribute to the growing archive by uploading their own work. On some occasions, the stage in Horizon becomes the space for live activations as we stream artist talks, performances, concerts, and workshops into the digital world. digital arts and art and technology. I just, when I was younger, like, 
I felt like anytime I brought up queer topics in a digital space, um, I was completely shot down. And yeah, I'm I mean, sorry. actually, even Zach, I say that like, th this is why your work has been so meaningful to me is because right now I don't really have that space because I would hit Pinar, but um, you want to stretch both your arms out and just be able to kind of wiggle those fingers and not hit anyone or anything, at least not unconsensually. Um, and so this practice, which we'll guide you through in a moment, it has dual functions, like it's really grounding to our nervous systems. Queering the map moves away from thinking queer space as fixed and towards an approach to queer placemaking that's rooted in action as something that is responsive, relational, contingent, and in flux. Horizon was launched in January 2021 with the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum as a virtual expansion of the museum's exhibition, Countryside the Future. It was made possible through the generous support of the Guggenheim Museum and a Night Arts Challenge grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. And so, you know, when we talked a bit about world building earlier, uh, when we do so, I don't mean to suggest a grand project of remaking every aspect of the world in light of queer theory. Rather, these worlds are already growing and building within this one and underneath it. This project, this insistence on the potentiality of queer space and queer time, is part of a plurality of other ways of living on the planet. And so celebrating these bursts of utopia keeps us going between revolutions, helping us to create a playbook for organizing online and offline. It opens up further questions about how to tell the stories of these places and how to preserve them. In my case, I find it best and most interesting to honor them through continuing their legacy and building new spaces, viewing these predecessors as queer ancestors that continue to inspire a new generation to dream up different ways of connecting to each other and the landscape. So ultimately, this storytelling, this inspiration spanning time by bringing in influences from theorists and spaces before me, and space by working with remote cohorts of people in different cities, um, has inspired me to materialize worlds in the spirit of the, this mutualism, um, but physically and locally in the city I call home.